The Turn of the Screw by Henry James Chapter 12 The particular impression I had received proved in the morning light. I repeat, not quite successfully presentable to Mrs. Gross, though I reinforced it with the mention of still another remark that he had made before we separated. It all lies in half a dozen words, I said to her. Words that really settle the matter. Think, you know, what I might do. He threw that off to show me how good he is. He knows down to the ground what he might do. That's what he gave them a taste of at school. Lord, you do change, cried my friend. I don't change. I simply make it out. The four, depend upon it, perpetually meet. If on either of these last nights you had been with either child, you would clearly have understood. The more I've watched and waited, the more I've felt that if there were nothing else to make it sure, it would be made so by the systematic silence of each. Never by a slip of the tongue have they so much as alluded to either of their old friends any more than Miles has alluded to his expulsion. Oh, yes, we may sit here and look at them, and they may show off to us to their fill. But even while they pretend to be lost in their fairy tale, they're steeped in their vision of the dead restored. He's not reading to her, I declared. They're talking of them. They're talking horrors. I go on, I know, as if I were crazy. And it's a wonder I'm not. What I've seen would have made you so, but it has only made me more lucid, made me get hold of still other things. My lucidity must have seemed awful, but the charming creatures who were victims of it, passing and repassing in their interlocked sweetness, gave my colleague something to hold on by and I felt how tight she held, as, without stirring in the breath of my passion, she covered them still with her eyes. Of what other things have you got hold? Why, of the very things that have delighted, fascinated, and yet, at bottom, as I now so strangely see, mystified and troubled me, they're more than earthly beauty. They're absolutely unnatural goodness. It's a game, I went on. It's a policy and a fraud. On the part of little darlings? As yet mere lovely babies? Yes, mad as that seems. The very act of bringing it out really helped me to trace it. Follow it all up and piece it all together. They haven't been good. They've only been absent. It has been easy to live with them, because they're simply leading a life of their own. They are not mine. They are not ours. They are his and they're hers. Quince and that woman's? Quince and that woman's. They want to get them. Oh, how at this poor Mrs. Gross appeared to study them. But for what? For the love of all the evil that in those dreadful days the pair put into them. And to ply them with that evil still, to keep up the work of demons, is what brings the others back. Laws, said my friend under her breath. The exclamation was homely, but it revealed a real acceptance of my further proof of what, in the bad time, for there had been a worse even than this, must have occurred. There could have been no such justification for me as the plain assent of her experience, to whatever depth of depravity I found credible in our brace of scoundrels. It was in obvious submission of memory that she brought out after a moment. They were rascals. 
But what can they now do? she pursued. Do? I echoed so loud that Miles and Flora, as they passed at their distance, paused an instant in their walk and looked at us. Don't they do enough? I demanded in a lower tone, while the children, having smiled and nodded and kissed hands to us, resumed their exhibition. We were held by it a minute. Then I answered, They can destroy them. At this my companion did turn, but the inquiry she launched was a silent one, the effect of which was to make me more explicit. They don't know as yet quite how. But they're trying hard. They're seen only across, as it were, and beyond, in strange places and on high places, the top of towers, the roof of houses, the outside of windows, the further edge of pools. But there's a deep design, on either side, to shorten the distance and overcome the obstacle, and the success of the tempters is only a question of time. They've only to keep to their suggestions of danger. For the children to come? And perish in the attempt. Mrs. Gross slowly got up, and I scrupulously added, Unless, of course, we can prevent. Standing there before me while I kept my seat, she visibly turned things over. Their uncle must do the preventing. He must take them away. And who's to make him? She had been scanning the distance, but she now dropped on me a foolish face. You, miss, by writing to him that his house is poisoned and his little nephew and niece mad? But if they are, miss, and if I am myself, you mean? That's charming news to be sent him by a governess whose prime undertaking was to give him no worry. Mrs. Gross considered, following the children again. Yes, he do hate worry. That was the great reason why those friends took him in so long. No doubt, though his indifference must have been awful. As I'm not a fiend, at any rate, I shouldn't take him in. My companion, after an instant, and for all answer, sat down again and grasped my arm. Make him at any rate come to you. I stared. To me? I had a sudden fear of what she might do. Him? He ought to be here. He ought to help. I quickly rose, and I think I must have shown her a queerer face than ever yet. You see me asking him for a visit? No, with her eyes on my face she evidently couldn't. Instead of it even, as a woman reads another, she could see what I myself saw, his derision, his amusement, his contempt for the breakdown of my resignation at being left alone and for the fine machinery I had set in motion to attract his attention to my slighted charms. She didn't know. No one knew how proud I had been to serve him and to stick to our terms. Yet she none the less took the measure, I think, of the warning I now gave her. If you should so lose your head as to appeal to him for me, she was really frightened. Yes, miss. I would leave, on the spot, both him and you. End of chapter 12